Hello ladies and gents, this is Daniel for Rock the JVM and in this long form video I'm going to demonstrate a bunch of techniques with Akka integrated with Cassandra and a few other bits in the Scala ecosystem. So here I'm going to demonstrate a mini project with Akka typed, Akka persistence, Akka HTTP, Cassandra as a persistent storage and some cats for data validation. So this will require some basics of Akka and cats which we teach here at Rock the JVM and and in a bunch of other places here on the Rock the JVM channel and blog, and also Docker installed on your computer. I'm going to show you what you need to do step by step. And as recommendations, I will ask you to code with me because there's no better way to learn these techniques than to try them on your own. You can also find a written form of this video at the Rock the JVM blog with the link in the description. All right, so in this video, we are going to demonstrate a so-called mini bank application where we are going to update people's bank accounts, create them, destroy them, update their balances, and so on and so forth. So we will need to design this bank application in terms of actors, Akka HTTP for a server, and Cassandra as a storage system. So each bank account for every person will be a persistent actor that will store all the relevant events of that bank account to Cassandra. So we will use event sourcing for this application. So all the events are recorded to Cassandra and they're replayed in case one of the actor dies or the entire application needs to be restarted. We will also have one bigger actor that will be the bank itself that will manage all of the accounts. And we will interact with this entire system through an HTTP REST API. So we will start an Akka HTTP server that we will use to interact with a bank account and therefore with every single account underneath. And all of these events will be stored in Cassandra for long term storage and also for event sourcing in case we need to replay those events in the case of failure. Now, in terms of the HTTP REST API, the application that we're going to write in this video will have a pretty simple HTTP API. We'll have a post at the root location, which will create a bank account, a get at a UUID, which is the unique identifier of a bank account to retrieve the current details of that bank account, and an update in the form of an HTTP put. And you can find the relevant responses in the table below. Now you don't need to memorize them because I'm going to show you step by step what we need to do. So without further ado, I'm going to go back to my little project here that I've created in IntelliJ IDEA. This is a plain Scala project and I've added here under build.sbt, I've added all the relevant libraries that we're going to need for this video and I'm going to have them ready for you in the blog post. So you can check out the link in the description and paste the build.sbt and add it here to your own project if you want to add the entire set of libraries. And after you add them, you can go to view and then tool windows and then SBT. And uh, if IntelliJ does not download all the libraries for you automatically, you can click this refresh button to force IntelliJ to download them. Cool, so if you need to pause the video, go ahead and pause it and add your build SVT to your own project. And besides that, I'm going to add another file that I'm gonna call docker-compose-yml. For those of you who know Docker, you know what this is. Docker-compose-yml is the specification of Docker services that we are going to use in this video and we're going to use Cassandra here. So in this Docker Compose file, I'm going to add the version, which is 3.8, the latest at the moment of this recording. And we're gonna add a bunch of services and we're gonna add Cassandra. And I'm going to use the image as Cassandra. And the version is 403. And I'm going to expose some ports. And uh, the port that I'm going to open is 9042, the classical one for Cassandra, so that we can add um, or we can interact with Cassandra on CQL. And for environment, I'm going to use the configuration Cassandra cluster name equals, and I'm going to give it a, a name, let's call this Akka-Cassandra dash cluster or something like that. So this is the entire Docker Compose YML that we're going to need in this video. After you add this Docker Compose file, you can open a terminal window, assuming you have Docker installed on your computer already. So I have here a terminal window. I've navigated to the project that I'm writing here from scratch, and I'm going to hit this command docker dash compose up to spin up the Cassandra Docker container. So hit this one. 
Now, the first time you run this, this will probably take a few minutes to pull the image. I already have one on my computer, so if this takes a little longer, don't fret. Just pause the video until this thing is done. Or you can simply carry on and get back to the code while the Docker container is running. And uh, after uh, the log stops pushing some output, you can open another terminal window and you can do docker ps to understand what kind of Docker containers you have already. I have Aka Cassandra Bank Cassandra underscore one. This is the name of my Docker container. And I'm going to use Docker exec dash it, this thing, and then CQLSH, the uh, Cassandra query language shell. And here we have CQLSH. Uh, if the Cassandra Docker container uh, spawn up correctly, then you should see this new prompt here, which we won't need to use at the moment because we don't have any tables. Once Akka actors start writing to the Cassandra table, we will have some tables to inspect, but right now we are good to go with the Cassandra Docker container. So if you need more time, just pause the video until the Docker container has finished downloading and setting up. Run this command, docker exec dash it, and then use this name, aka Cassandra bank underscore Cassandra one. This is quite a mouthful. And CQL sh, the SQL shell. And uh, you should be able to obtain this prompt. After you've done that, you can come back to the code because we're going to start actually implementing some of our actors. So under our project, we have source main Scala here. Obviously, we don't have any code. And I'm going to create a new package. I'm going to use com.rockthejvm. And I'm going to use actors here as our first package. And under the actors package, I'm going to create my first Scala class. I'm going to call this persistent bank account. So leave it a class for now. We're going to modify the code as we go along. So this persistent bank account is at the bottom of the hierarchy. This will denote a single bank account. So this single bank account will receive some messages and will store some events to Cassandra. This is the event sourcing approach to storing data. So the long story short with event sourcing, if you haven't heard this before, unlike traditional databases where we store the latest state of the data in the database, in event sourcing, we store events, that is bits of the data, which comprise the journey to the latest state of the data at this moment. So we obtain the latest state of the application by replaying all of these events one by one. Now, this event sourcing technique, although a little bit more costly, is also much more powerful and much richer in information for a variety of reasons. For instance, for event sourcing in the case of fault tolerance, that is, uh, in the case that the application fails for some reason, if it crashes or if an actor dies or if the server uh, goes down, you'll have the entire journey to the latest state of the application written in your database. So it's no biggie to simply replay all these events and get back to the same state. That is one. Also, in the case of a bank account, it's much more important to be able to audit the entire journey of the bank account. So auditing purpose. And um, if you uh, get a suspicious transaction that you didn't notice at some point in the past, you can always revisit that and figure out if something went wrong at that time and do something about it, even though that transaction or the deposit or withdrawal or whatever occurred earlier in time. So fault tolerance and auditing are the two biggest reasons why we want to use event sourcing. And uh, we're going to make this persistent bank account a persistent actor, which implements the event sourcing technique out of the box. Now, a persistent actor in Aka will need to handle a bunch of data structures. First, we need commands, which are the messages themselves. And uh, you probably know of Aka actors that they receive messages asynchronously. We need to store events to the database. So these are the data structures to persist to Cassandra. Then we have state, which is the internal state of this bank account, which is its own data structure, and also responses that we want to send back to whoever queries or wants to modify the bank account. So we will need to define some data structures to describe all of these. Now, for commands, I'm going to define a seal trade. I'm going to call this command, and I'm going to define a bunch of data structures that will signify a bunch of modifications to this bank account. So for example, I'm going to create a case class. And I'm going to call this create bank account. And I'm going to have a user as a string and uh, the currency 
as a string, the initial um, initial balance, and I'm going to use a double here, but with a caveat, do not use double for uh, storing money in a real application. I'm going to uh, uh, describe shortly why. And a, a reply to actor that you will use to store a response. So I'm going to call this reply to as an actor ref. So I'm going to have an actor ref of, and the message type is going to be a response. I'm going to have a sealed trait. I'm going to call this response. And this response will be used in this act ref that I'm going to communicate my status back to. So I'm going to have response here. Now, why did I say that the double type is not appropriate for money? Well, uh, it's because the floating point standard, the IEEE uh, 754, is inappropriate for storing arbitrary decimals. And uh, that means tenths and hundredths, which are the two significant digits uh, in which uh, pretty much all money is stored. And uh, this poses some trouble when you want to multiply with percentages, with other doubles, and even plain arithmetic can break some precision, which means that people's money can be added or subtracted for the simple lack of proper arithmetic on floating points, which can be um, a serious bug and can be exploited, which is the reason why we never use double for currency. We use other specialized data structures for money. Now, I'm not an expert on money, but I do understand the technical um, caveats to using double. So be very careful of using that. I'm going to then create a case class for an update. So an update balance. And I'm going to have an ID as a string. This is going to be the um, uh, bank account in question, the identifier of the bank account. The currency as a string, if you want to do some currency exchanges, maybe. Then the amount, which is a double. And uh, I'm using, I'm continuing to use double here for uh, ease of use because it's built into the language. And the reply to is another actor ref of response. And this amount can be positive or negative. So this update balance can both be a withdrawal or a deposit. So this can be negative. So it can be less than zero. Okay, then I'm going to have a case class. Let's call this get bank account. If somebody wants to obtain some um, details about this bank account, maybe uh, people want to see their balance in their mobile application. So I'm going to have an ID as a string, the unique identifier of the bank account, and the reply to as an actor ref of command, of a response. Okay, so these are the commands that I will implement. Now, the events themselves will be the uh, data structures that I'm going to use persist to Cassandra that will guarantee the fact that once replayed, I'm going to be able to obtain the latest state of my application. And the state is going to be a plain data structure. I'm going to call this case class. I'm going to call this bank account or state if you'd like. I'm going to uh, create a string as an identifier of the bank account, the username as a string, maybe a, an internal representation of that, the currency as a string, and the balance, which is a double. Of course, never use double um, for money in production. We already talked about that. And the events are some data structures that will signify an action or something that happened to this bank account. So I'm going to create a trait called event. And I'm going to create a case class. I'm going to call this bank account created. And um, I'm going to store my bank account as a bank account data structure. So upon creation, I'm going to store this data structure into Cassandra and this extends event. And by the way, I'm going to uh, make all of these uh, extend command. And this extends command. And this other one extends command as well. So all these extend command. This one extends event. And uh, the bank account created is the first event. And I'm going to create another case class. And I'm going to call this uh, balance updated as new balance as a double. And uh, you can uh, uh, store either the new balance or the updated amount. And uh, I think this is more interesting here. So I'm going to store the amount that was either added or removed from the bank account. And this extends event as well. Then we have the state of the bank account actor. And I'm going to have a response. Again, I'm going to define some case classes. I'm going to call this bank account created response that will have an ID, which is uniquely generated for um, this 
particular actor. So once the bank itself tries to create the bank account, I'm going to reply with a bank account created response with a newly created unique identifier. So this extends response. I'm going to create another case class, uh, bank account balance updated response. And uh, I'm going to store uh, the uh, new state of the bank account because I might be interested in the new balance at the bank site. So I don't really, uh, I'm not really interested in recomputing the balance. So I'm going to have, uh, let's call this maybe bank account as an option of bank account. And I'm using an option because if somebody tries to update balance on a bank account that's non-existent, then this option should be none. So I'm going to extend response. And finally, I'm going to create a case class. Let's call this get bank account response. And again, I'm going to have a maybe bank account as an option with bank account. So if somebody tries to obtain a bank account with an ID that does not exist in the hierarchy, I'm going to return none in this data structure. So this extends response. And we have all the data structures that we need. So we have commands, events, states, and uh, responses. Now I'm going to go ahead and create the persistent bank account actor. Now a persistent actor is defined in terms of two things, a command handler and an event handler plus a state. So every persistent actor will have a state in which case in our case, this will be a bank account data structure. And a command handler will be pretty much a message handler that uh, upon the reception of a message, this will persist an event. And the event after being persisted to the persistent store, in our case, Cassandra, will be subject to this event handler, which will be usually to update state. And that updated state will be then used on the next command, on the next message that will be uh, received by this persistent actor. So the mechanism is a little bit more complicated and the API is quite involved, but I'm going to walk you step by step. So first, I'm going to create a command handler. This is a function from state and a command message. So this, in our case, is a bank account. And the message is command. So upon the reception of a command and with this current state of the persistent actor, we will produce what is called an effect. And uh, the effect is going to be from this package, Aka persistence typed Scala DSL. So make sure you import the right one. And effect has two type arguments and uh, I'm going to use the event trait and the state, which is bank account. And I'm going to keep it unimplemented for now. So the command handler is a function from the command that is the message that the actor has just received with the current state of the actor at this time. And this will produce an effect which has the type event and the same state, same bank account type. The other uh, handler is going to be the event handler, which is also a function from a state, which is a bank account and the event that's just been persisted. And the end result of that, of that is going to be an updated state. So in this case, a new bank account. I'm going to keep this unimplemented for now. And I'm going to define an apply method that will take an ID as a string and I'm going to uniquely generate this in the main bank account actor. And this is going to be a behavior and the behavior is pretty much the message handler that um, is defined in the ACA type library. So I'm going to have a behavior of command. So this actor is described in terms of this behavior, which uh, receives just these command messages. And uh, obviously the implementation of this behavior will take into account the command handler and event handler. But the main API of this actor is going to be just the behavior of command. And for ACA persistence, I'm going to use uh, event sourced behavior and we'll need to have three type arguments. First of all, the message type command, the event type, and the state type, which is a bank account. So notice that we have message, event, and state. And we're going to pass a bunch of arguments here. We're going to use a persistence ID, which is a unique identifier by which we will identify messages or events uh, of this actor in the persistence store. So I'm going to have persistence ID 
from Occupersistence type, so I'm going to use that. Of unique ID, and I'm going to pass this ID as a string because this is a unique identifier generating the main bank account. I'm going to use the empty state as a empty data structure, so I'm going to have to uh, create a bank account with we have an ID, which is a string. Uh, the ID, uh, we're going to use uh, the user as an empty string, the currency as an empty string, and the balance as 0, 0.0. Now, this empty state will never be used because once this persistent actor is being created, we're going to store pretty much everything in the in a new data structure. So this will be unused, but it's important for aqua persistence. Then I'm going to use the command handler as the command handler. And the event handler as the event handler function that I've just created. Now, let me go ahead and implement these two. So we have the command handler and the event handler. Okay, so this is a two argument function. Okay, so I'm going to use state and command, arrow, and I'm going to use a pattern match on this command. So I'm going to have command match, and I'm going to run a pattern match on the uh, cases that I have here at the top. So in case I get a create bank account with a user currency, uh, what did I have there? Initial balance and the reply to actor. I'm going to fetch my unique identifier. So I'm going to have val ID as state.id. So state is the bank account data structure which has the unique identifier. All right. So I'm going to obtain that and I'm going to use, I'm going to create an effect which persists an event. So I'm going to use the following structure. I'm going to say effect dot persist. And notice that we have a bunch of arguments here. So this is a builder pattern. I'm going to use persist and I'm going to persist a single event, which is bank account created. This is the event. Now the bank account created will have a data structure which contains the new state, which is a bank account. So I'm going to have bank account with ID, the unique identifier, the user, the currency and the initial balance because they're all contained in the create bank account message. And then I'm going to pass a message. So I'm going to say then reply. So I'm going to then reply to this reply to actor, which is going to be my main bank actor. So the bank actor will talk to me to create this bank account. And then I'm going to reply to it this response, the bank account created response. So I'm going to have um, a lambda which says uh, bank account created response with that unique identifier. So the main bank actor will instantiate this persistent actor by calling apply and then it will immediately send to me the create bank account message so that I initialize my state. All right. So the the way that this is going to work is that the main bank account is going to spawn this persistent actor and then it will send this create bank account message to me, the persistent bank account actor. And I'm going to persist this bank account created event into Cassandra. So this is persisted uh, into Cassandra. And after it's being persisted, the event handler will take care to update my own state with the ID, user, currency, and initial balance. So this event will be used to update my own state. And after that happens, I'm going to reply back to the main bank account, uh, to the main bank actor with this response that it can surface back to the HTTP server. So the stages are, first of all, uh, bank creates me, bank sends me a uh, create bank account. Now I persist uh, this uh, bank account created, then I update my state with this new bank account. And then I'm going to reply back to bank with the bank account uh, created response. And finally, uh, the bank surfaces the uh, response from uh, or to the HTTP server. All right, so this happens after that. This is not up to me. I'm going to uh, implement this functionality a little bit later. Cool. So this is the sequence of operations. Now let's handle the rest of the messages. So in case I get uh, what do we have here, an update uh, balance. Okay, so we have an update balance. 
I don't really care about the ID and uh, the currency because the bank is supposed to filter those out for me. I might do some uh, extra checks here. So this is to do for you if you want to uh, add some more functionality here or extra or more stringent checks. The amount is going to be a, a positive or a negative number and then the reply to actor. So reply to. Now I'm going to create, I'm going to obtain my new balance as uh, state dot balance plus the amount. Now I will have to check if the amount is negative and bigger in absolute value than the state balance. So this is going to have to be a check here for withdrawal. So I'm going to do an if saying if new balance is less than zero, then this is illegal. And uh, I will have to use, I'm going to return an effect dot reply. And I'm going to use this reply to actor because this is going to be my main bank actor. And I'm going to reply with a bank account uh, balance updated response with none. As I mentioned earlier, this bank account updated response is going to return an option with a bank account if the operation was successful, none otherwise. So I'm going to return a none. Now you can create a different data structure here. Maybe you can use a try or some other data structure that might surface out the reason why the bank account updating failed. I'm going to simply use a none here. Now, uh, I uh, forget the API. Um, the lambda here is only applicable to the effect dot persist thing. So then reply, then you'll have the new state after the uh, event was handled. And then you can use that state to inform the message that you will use. But in this case, with effect dot reply, you don't have that. So I'm going to return the none here in the case the check failed. Otherwise, I'm going to use the effect dot persist. And I'm going to persist the uh, balance updated um, event here. So I'm going to have balance updated. Balance updated with new balance. Now you can use the amount or the new balance depending on how you like to model this. I've added the amount, so I'm going to pass the amount here. And then I'm going to say then reply to the reply to actor. And this will take a lambda that contains the existing state. Um, I'm going to contain the new state here. And then I'm going to uh, return bank account uh, balance updated response with some new state, meaning that the uh, update balance command worked successfully. And I'm going to update to the bank account. I'm going to return to the bank account this message containing some new state and the bank uh, actor will uh, be able to handle that. So that was the update balance. And in case I get uh, what do we have here, we have get bank account. So I'm going to have get bank account with the ID and uh, reply to. I'm going to return effect dot reply to the reply to actor, which is my bank account. And uh, I'm going to have the get uh, bank account response with some state, which is the state at the top of the function. So the bank actor, the main bank actor will create this persistent bank account actor. And after it creates this bank account, it will send the create bank account message, which will initialize its state. And whenever the bank actor receives some commands, those commands will reach back to me. So the bank actor will forward those to me. So when I get an update balance, I'm going to reply back to the bank. I'm actually going to rename this to say bank here because um, this is more descriptive, not just the reply to this is pretty generic, I'm going to call this bank. All right, so this is the command handler for the messages that this persistent actor will receive. Now, let's talk about the event handler, I'm going to run a two argument function, which is state and event. Then I'm going to run a pattern match on the event. So event match. And there are two events that I can persist, I persist a bank account created and balance updated. So I'm going to have a case for each. So bank account created with a bank account. Uh, then I'm going to 
update the state. So I'm going to return a new bank account, which is this exact one. So I'm going to return bank account. And in case I get balance updated with the amount, I'm going to return a new state copy. So I'm going to have uh, to say state.copy, not, not currency, but copy, where the balance is equal to state.balance plus the amount. And that is my event handler. And at this point, the persistent bank account is pretty much complete. All right, now we would probably need to test this, but the persistent bank account will depend on a bank actor. So we will need to create that in order to be able to test this whole combination. So here under the actors package, I'm actually gonna rename this to comrock.jvm.bank. I'm gonna call this as the application. And uh, here on the, the actors package, I'm gonna create another Scala class. I'm gonna call this bank. And uh, I'm going to make this bank actor a persistent actor as well, which means that I need to def define uh, some messages, that is commands. So we will need to define some commands that this bank can take. We need to define the events that the bank will persist to Cassandra and the state of this bank actor. Now, in terms of commands, I would like the bank actor to receive the same commands as the persistent bank account. So this bank actor will receive the commands, will serve as the entry point for all those commands. And upon reception of those commands, they will be forwarded to the appropriate persistent bank account actor. So I'll probably need to take away all of these commands and service them out to the bank. So I'm going to define an object called command and I'm going to put all these case classes inside so I will place all the specific cases of command and then I'm going to import everything so I'm going to import command dot everything or even better I can take all of these definitions and place them in a companion object to persistent bank account so I'm going to scroll all the way down I'm going to create an object persistent bank account and I'm going to take all of those definitions and I'm going to put them in the in the companion object. So we have all these definitions here. Now import command underscore doesn't matter, but I will need to import all the definitions from the companion object. So persistent bank account everything. Cool. And I'm going to also import persistent bank account dot command dot everything. And this is important because if I don't do it, then the uh, commands themselves will not be known to inside the persistent bank account class. And also I've isolated them inside the command object because I want to import them specifically under the bank actor. So here under bank, I'm going to import persistent bank account command everything. So I have access to all the commands of the persistent bank account here in this bank actor. Now this uh, organization may not be necessarily to your liking. Maybe you, you're interested in uh, taking all those commands and putting them here under the bank actor instead of the persistent bank account, right? But uh, I'll make do with this organization for now at least. So we have all, all the commands here under the bank actor. As for events, I'm going to define a sealed trait. So sealed trait, I'm going to call this event. And I'm going to create a case class. And uh, for bank, the only event that I really want to persist is that the bank account was created. So I'm going to have a case class for bank account created, which takes an ID as a string, and this extends event. So this is for the bank actor to keep track of all the creation of all the bank accounts. And the persistent bank account will also keep track of its own events. So we can keep track of separate events for both the bank actor and each persistent bank account in turn. Now, in terms of state, this bank actor will keep track of pretty much all the persistent bank accounts. And uh, this will essentially be a map where the key is going to be the unique identifier of each persistent actor. So I'm going to create a case class, I'm going to call this state, and uh, I'm going to store the accounts as a map of string and actor ref of command. Now this command is uh, the persistent bank account. So I'm going to um, import persistent bank account dot command explicitly. So the trait command that I'm going to put here under the, uh, the type signature of the actor ref. So I've defined all the commands, which are imported, all the events, 
and the state. Now, because this bank actor is also a persistent actor, I will need to define it in terms of a message handler or a command handler. Then we need an event handler. And finally, the apply method to build the behavior. So uh, I'm going to define each of these in turn. So the command handler is going to be, uh, as it was the case with a persistent bank account, a function. So I'm going to have a val, let's call this command handler. And uh, this will be a function from the state and the command. And this will return an effect that I'm going to have to import. So make sure you import the right one from the Scala DSL package. So an effect from uh, of type event, which is this trait over here, and the same kind of state that we defined here in the function. So I'm going to have state here. I'm going to leave this unimplemented for now. So the command handler is a function that contains the actor's current state and the command that it has just received, and it produces an effect where the event type is denoted by the event trait here and the same kind of state that we produced uh, earlier. Cool. So we have the command handler as a signature at least. Then we have the event handler as a function from state and event, and this produces a new state. I'm going to leave this unimplemented as well. And the behavior itself is going to be an apply method. So I'm going to define an apply that is going to return a behavior of type command. And I'm going to leave it unimplemented because the apply method should be part a, of a companion object, but I've made the bank a class. I'm going to make it an object altogether because all these are just definitions and the apply method will spin up uh, the behavior of an actor. So I'm going to make it an object, which reminds me that the persistent bank account has a class and the companion object. That was a little bit of a mistake on my part. I'm going to take all these definitions, I'm going to bring them back. And I'm going to make this persistent bank account an object because we're in the same situation here as well. So I'm going to remove the companion and I've just made the class an object with all the definitions here. So uh, I, do, I don't need to import anything. I need to import just the command object with all the definitions so that I make them known inside this object. So a little bit of back and forth. So the persistent bank account is pretty much an object with all the same definitions. And the bank is also an object with an apply method that returns the behavior of the command. Cool. So in this case, I'm going to return again, an event st sourced behavior. So this will be event sourced behavior with the types command. This is the message that the bank uh, actor will receive, the event that it will persist to Cassandra, and the state that it will manage internally. So I'm going to pass the persistence ID. So persistence ID as uh, persistence ID. And uh, I need to import that of unique ID. And I'm going to call this bank. I'm pretty sure this will be unique for our entire application, the empty state. So the empty state is going to be state with map exactly like this. Then we have the command handler equals command handler and the event handler equals event handler. All right, so this is our event source behavior. All right, cool. Now let's go implement our command handler and event handler. Now the command handler will need to uh, be able to treat all these commands. Now to remind us, we have create bank account, update balance and get bank account. These will all uh, be sent from the HTTP server. So the HTTP server will create all these data structures, and they will be sent to me, the bank actor that will trigger the creation of bank accounts. So I'm going to run my little function state and command. And then I need to return the effect. So I'm going to run a pattern match on command, some command match. And um, I'm going to treat all the cases. So in case we get a create bank account with user currency initial balance and the reply to actor. Here, I need to spin up a new child actor. So here, I'm going to uh, define a val as a unique identifier, I'm going to call this ID as UUID 
from job util random uuid dot to string. So this is a simple unique identifier, and I'm going to create a child actor, which is my new bank account. And I'm, I need the actor's context to be able to spin up the child actor because I don't have the actor context here under either state or the command. So in Akka, we do uh, context.spawn. Now, obviously, we don't have ac access to the actor context unless here in this behavior we uh, obtain it somehow. So I'm going to wrap this event source behavior into a call to behaviors plural. Make sure you import the right one. Dot setup, which gives us this actor context. So the setup method will give us the actor context and then the behavior that we are going to return after that. So the context will now be provided to us. Now, this event source behavior will need to pass this context reference somehow. So the command handler will have to be, uh, instead of a val, I'm going to make it a def, so a method that takes the context as the actor context actor context of command, which is the same type as the uh, bank actor that I want to spin up. So the command handler will be invoked on the context. Right, so now we have access to the context because it was uh, passed by behaviors.setup. So now I can spin up a child actor. So context.spawn, and then I'm going to use uh, the behavior, which is my persistent bank account. Uh, applied to this unique identifier. So the persistent bank account has an apply method that returns a behavior. So the persistent bank account on ID, I'm going to use that ID also as the internal actor name in the actor system. Okay, so I've spun up my child actor. Now I need to return an effect. Now, after I've created this persistent bank account with this unique identifier, assuming that any user has the right to create as many accounts as they want, because it may be a cheap operation for us. I'm going to return an effect, and I'm going to persist. And I'm going to persist this bank account created event. So I'm going to say event.persist on this uh, bank account created on this new ID. So the bank actor will store this event into Cassandra, and then I'm going to pass this create bank account message to the actor itself so that it can spin up its initial state. So I'm going to say then reply on the new bank account that was just created because this is an actor ref. And I will need to uh, pass a lambda that uh, uses this bank state, but I don't use it here. And I'm going to pass this same message, which is uh, the same um, uh, create bank account command. So I'm going to call this create command at and notice that I'm not using anything user currency initial balance. Uh, I might simply replace these with underscores. Obviously, when you want to uh, put some more logic here, you may want to um, check whether the user has the right to create an account. Maybe you want to charge them per account or uh, lots of logic that you want to create there. And I'm going to use this uh, create command. So I'm passing this create command to the newly created persistent bank account. So once it's being created, then this whole command will get to it. And then once the bank account actor receives this create bank account, it will start its internal state and will also store its own event. All right. So this is what we want to do if we want to create a bank account in case we get um, what do we have here? Under command, we have an update balance on a particular amount. Cool. So I'm going to write an update balance here with all the right fields. So we have ID, currency, amount, and the reply to actor. And this reply to actor may be external to the bank, so I'm going to keep it at that. And uh, I'm going to try to find the bank account associated to this ID. So I'm going to state dot accounts dot get on an ID, which notice that this is an option of the actor ref, which denotes this bank account. So I'm going to run a, another pattern match inside. You can also do this with flat maps if you want, but uh, we're going to run different effects depending on the cases here. So in case we get a sum account, that means that we do have an account here. I'm going to send the same update balance to the bank account itself. I'm not going to do anything else. So I'm going to simply forward the update balance 
message to that account. So I'm going to say effect.reply to the bank account. So account. And I'm going to send this update balance message. So let's call this update command at update balance. And I don't need the currency amount to reply to. Maybe we'll replace some of these parameters with underscores. We'll see. So I'm going to pass the same update command there. And in case I get a none, then I will need to reply to this reply to thing, which is an actor ref of responses. Now responses are defined here under the persistent bank account. So the responses are bank account created response, bank account balance updated response with an option. So I'm going to reply to the destination actor with a none here because the update message could not trigger an effect. So in case none, I'm going to say effect dot reply to the reply to actor. So the final destination here, and I'm going to reply with a bank account. What was that? So I'm going to get back here, we have we have balance updated response. So I'm going to use this bank account balance updated response. And I might have to import it. I don't really like that. I'm going to treat import shortly. So bank account balance updated response with a none because this is a failed account search. All right, cool. Now, let me treat the imports for a second. I'm going to go back to my persistent actor and I'm going to run an object here for response. And I'm going to write put all the some shortcut conflicts. Okay, so I'm going to put all the case classes inside and I'm going to import response dot everything. And here under the bank actor, I'm also going to import the response thing. So response. So that I have all the all the traits here. Okay, all the case classes. Cool. So that was for the update balance and I don't need the currency, I don't need the amount because the persistent bank account will treat the internal logic of updating its own balance. So as the bank actor, I'm simply forwarding this update command message to that particular bank account. Of course, you can complicate this logic as far as you want. Now, we need to have another case for and we have a get bank account. So we have uh, get bank account for get bank account for an ID and uh, reply to message the reply to actor and this is going to fetch the actor associated to this ID so I'm gonna say uh, state state dot accounts get ID and uh, I'm gonna run a pattern match again and in case I get some with an account I'm going to forward this message to the get bank account there. So I'm going to say effect dot reply to that account. And I'm going to pass this whole command. So get command at I'm going to pass this to that particular bank account. So I'm going to say get CMD. And in case I get a none, then I'm going to pretty much reply with a very similar response here. So I'm going to say effect dot reply to the destination message, which is the reply to actor with a get bank account response containing a none because this is a failed search. Cool. So this was the command handler for the bank actor. In case we want to create a bank account, I'm going to spin up a child actor, then I'm going to store uh, an event, and then I'm going to forward that command to the child actor. And in case I get an update balance and a get bank account, I'm simply going to forward that message to the bank account if there is such a bank account. Otherwise, I'm going to reply with a none to whoever asks me for that. Okay, so that was the command handler. Let's treat the event handler. And in this case, the event handler is a little bit more simple in this case because we only have a single event to persist. So I'm going to run my two argument function state and event. And I'm going to say event match. And in case we get a bank account created on the ID. So this was the event that I'm storing in Cassandra after it's being stored, I'm going to have to handle it. And then I'm going to update my internal state. 
Notice that I did not update my state here while I was creating the bank account, so I don't update the state here under the command handler. I only update state in the event handler. So I'm going to define my val uh, bank account. So account. And here in this case, because we don't have the account in the state yet, we need to store it into the state. We need to find it by some other means. And thankfully, the Aqua Actor system allows us to find a child actor based on its child name. So I need the actor context again. So I need to be able to pass it. So I'm going to use the context as the actor context of type command. And this is going to change to a method here. And I'm going to pass the actor context at the bottom. So now that I have access to the context, I can say context.child. And notice that you can find a child with or by a name. And this gives you back an option of an actor ref. So child of ID. Obviously, this is an option. So I need to be sure that it exists. And here we have a slightly more interesting problem because when the command handler succeeds, then I'm pretty sure that it does exist because it's just being created by context.spawn here in the command handler. And after the bank account created is persisted, then the event handler will have to treat that. So the context.child ID surely exists. So exists after the command handler. So that's for sure. But in the case of recovery, the command handler doesn't work. Only the event handler replays all the events persisted in Cassandra. So all the events stored in Cassandra will be replayed here by the event handler. And at this point, context.childID does not exist. So does not exist in the recovery mode. So I'll need to make sure that this um, a bank account needs to be created in recovery mode. So I'm going to simply call a get or else. And I'm going to spawn something. So I'm going to say context spawn. And I'm going to persist bank account persistent bank account with that ID and with the child name ID. So this exists after the command handler. So I'm going to add the comment here does not exist in the recovery mode. So needs to be created. So if the event handler operates while the actor is alive and uh, the command handler worked, then the get or else simply returns the child actor that was created beforehand. But in recovery mode, I need to create it. So as Cassandra gives me back the bank account created on the ID, I need to be able to spawn it. And once the persistent bank account is respawned, then the persistent bank account will start replaying its own events. So that's the general gist here. There's a lot of magic happening at this particular phase. So uh, I'm saying get or else. And this is of type actor ref nothing, I need to type that as actor ref command. So I'm going to say as instance of actor ref command. Now this as instance of is harmless because the actual uh, bank account actor is of the appropriate type either found here under context child or found under context dot spawn. So it does have the actor ref command type, I only need to uh, make this known to the compiler as well. So this as instance of is harmless. And then I'm going to store this account into the state finally. So I'm going to return a new state. So state.copy where uh, we have the accounts uh, as state.accounts plus the new association between ID and this account that I've either fetched from context.child or created in the case of recovery. All right, that was quite a big thing. And uh, the behavior has been described, the event handler has just been completed and the command handler was completed before. So we do have the bank account and the bank actor is created. Let's run a small application so that we test these two. So let's call this bank playground. And here under the bank account application, I'm going to define a main method that will make this a runnable thing. And I'm going to define the root behavior of a potential actor system, I'm going to call this root behavior, behavior, 
as a behavior. And uh, I'm not going to particularly use the actor system to exchange messages to the root guardian itself. So I'm going to use not used in this case, which is a glorified unit or nothing in Akka. And I'm going to have behaviors that set up. And considering the actor context of the root actor system, I'm going to create a bank. I combined val with bank, and I got vank. Bank as context spawn, and I'm going to spawn a bank actor. So bank with the name bank. And I'm going to ask the bank account. So I'm going to use the ask pattern. I'm going to send a message, and I'm going to expect a future of the response. Here in this lambda, I'm going to say behavior is empty so that I can get rid of the compiler error. So I'm going to use the ask pattern, which you know from the Rock the JVM channel that I've explained before. So I'm going to say bank.ask. Now, in order to use the ask method, I need to import the ask pattern so that the ask method is available as an extension method. So at here in the ask pattern, I'm going to import aka actor typed scala DSL and then ask pattern with a capital A, then everything, which will decorate this with the ask method. And uh, you can place this at, at the top if you'd like. I'm going to keep this on screen so that you know what to import. So I'm going to have bank.ask, and we're going to pass a lambda that given an intermediate actor, this is the reply to thing that I've uh, specified earlier. So reply to arrow, so given an intermediate actor that Akka creates just for this one interaction, I'm going to uh, run a create bank account. Now I think I've imported that, which I don't particularly like. I'm going to import here. So I'm going to import uh, persistent bank account everything, or persistent uh, account command everything. So create bank account with uh, some data, and uh, we have user currency. OK, so we have Daniel. Let's say we have currency USD, initial balance, let's say $10. And then the reply to actor, this is going to be the one. So reply to. And I need some implicits here. So we have a timeout and a scheduler. So I'm going to define those. So implicit val timeout as a timeout from all util. Going to define a timeout as two seconds, let's say. Of course, I need to import the seconds method. I'm going to go import Scala concurrent concurrent duration everything. I've done this more times than I can count. And um, we have the, the timeout here. Let me actually add the import for your convenience here on screen so that you know what to expect. And also the scheduler. So I'm going to say implicit val scheduler, which is scheduler from aqua actor typed as context system scheduler. So this is how we, uh, we obtain the scheduler capability of the actor system through the actor context. So we have bank.ask, and this is a future of a response. So this is uh, going to be the future that contains the response that the bank will send back to this intermediate actor, which will then fulfill the future. This is quite convoluted for the ask pattern. So I'm going to run a flat map here. And in case I get a bank account, create a response with an ID, I need to import the response also. So I'm going to run another import with response. So in case we get a bank account create response with an ID, I'm going to print something out. So I'm going to say context log info with say successfully created bank account. And I'm going to use this ID here. And then considering the ID, I'm going to send another message to bank. I'm going to use the ask pattern again. So ask on another kind of lambda. So reply to arrow. And I'm going to try to obtain the bank account details. So I'm going to say get bank account with that ID, which we've obtained here. And um, I'm going to also use the reply to message, the reply to actor. And um, this will contain the future of the response of this interaction. So I'm going to run a for each here. I don't care about other interactions. And in case I get a get bank account response containing, we have, um, what's that, we have an option of a bank account. So we have 
um, let's call this maybe bank account. And uh, I'm just gonna print all the details. So I'm gonna say context log info, and uh, I'm going to have account details, details, and I'm going to inject this maybe bank account. And we need some implicits here. This is the execution context so that we can run the future transformations. So I'm going to run another implicit EC for execution context as context dot execution context. This is just the thread pool for us to run the future. So this is the entire interaction. So I'm going to send the create bank account to the bank actor and I'm expecting this to create a persistent bank account. And I'm going to expect this bank account create a response and I'm going to print this details. And um, then I'm going to uh, take this ID and ask the bank again. So another interaction, this is interaction number two. And I'm going to expect again bank account response with the exact same bank details. Okay, that was quite a mouthful. Let's um, create the actor system. So system as actor system from aka actor typed with this root behavior. And let's call this bank demo. Right. So uh, probably after a couple of seconds, I'm going to shut down the actor system, but I'm going to terminate this from the console myself. And uh, we're almost done. So this application is runnable. But in order to interact with Cassandra itself, we need to connect the Aqua application to Cassandra. So we will need an application configuration. So here under source main Scala, under main, I'm going to create another directory. I'm going to call this resources. And the name is important because under source main resources, Akka will look for a particular file called application.conf. And here we're going to configure the details of the persistence journal. So we need two sets of configurations, one for the journal, which, the, which is the event store, and also for snapshots. And uh, this is the snapshot store. And snapshots are another useful feature of Aqua persistence. Very useful in the case that you persist a lot, a lot of events and replaying them would take a lot of time, which means that it's often the case that we need to store the exact state of the entire application in the database so that we can recover more easily. And this is the snapshot store. And we need to configure both for Cassandra to run. So the configuration are as follows. We have plugin. This is the plugin implementation, which in our case is persistence. And notice that IntelliJ is quite uh, handy here. So journal. And then we will need Aka persistence Cassandra journal. This will be the root configuration that we're then going to use dot and uh, we're going to have to specify some configuration to automatically create the tables in the Cassandra database itself. So I'm going to say key space dot auto create equals true. And uh, also going to use tables auto create. So I'm going to have tables dash auto create equals true. So in the moment when we persist our first event, this will take a little bit longer for Cassandra to uh, create the tables automatically. And we're also going to use a um, uh, configuration from data stacks, so I'm going to say data stacks dash Java driver. And I'm going to have advanced dot reconnect on init. I have some notes here that I'm using for these configurations. I don't know off the top of my head. And uh, that would have been a little crazy if I knew them off the top of my head. And uh, we're going to store some uh, equivalent configurations for the snapshot store. So we're going to have aka dot persistence dot and we have snapshot dash store dot plugin. And we're going to have aka persistence Cassandra snapshot instead of journal. So I'm going to copy this item here and instead of journal, I'm going to say snapshot. And we're going to copy these two configurations. And instead of journal, we're going to say snapshot in both cases. So the configurations to auto create the tables are true in this case as well. And also I'm going to allow Java serialization because I do not have the space here to specify a custom serialization. I do this in uh, 
a, a little course that I have called Aqua Serialization. So Aqua Actor dot allow Java Serialization equals on. I typed this myself, but you can find all of these configurations on uh, the blog post, so you can copy and paste them into an application.com file stored under source main resources. So make sure the, the file path is identical as shown here. Cool. So with these configurations in place, the bank playground application, where is that? We have the bank playground application, which is an ARC application. We'll fetch that application.com file and we'll use the Cassandra journal to store some events. Now we've written quite a bit of code and we haven't tested anything, so I hope I haven't missed something. Let's try to run this, making sure that your Docker container is active. All right, so make sure that this works. So I'm going to start the application, fingers crossed, a couple of seconds for the compiler to run. Come on, compiler, compile my massive code. All right, so we should be seeing some logs here. We have some logs and we also have some logs in the Docker container as well. Hopefully we have everything that we need. So we have quite a bunch of stuff. Reflective set accessible true. This is this is uh, a red herring, so this is not uh, necessarily a problem. Also here, this is good. Graph traversal. This is not that big of a deal. And uh, we should. I'm gonna search for successfully. So successfully wrote Q. Okay successfully wrote, successfully created. So nothing with the bank. Okay, recovery successful, handled account. Okay, so we have the replay of events because the bank actor is persistent. So we don't have anything to recover, neither for snapshots nor for events here. So this handled command, this is cool, resulting effect. Persistent bank account created. This is great. So we have some message uh, written to the Cassandra store. We're gonna check that out in just a second. So we have handle command. This is good. And uh, using the Java serializer. Okay, handle command message to actor was not delivered. Okay, that's a problem. So we have the persistent bank account dot response bank account created response. This was not delivered. Why was that? I'm going to do a little bit of searching here. So it seems that the persistent bank account could not reply to this reply to actor. My hunch is that this reply to actor was intermediary and uh, this turned into dead letters. So I'm going to attempt fixing that by uh, replacing this reply to intermediate actor with an actual actor that can log things. So I'm going to write a uh, full-fledged actor that can handle all these responses. Now I'm interested at this phase whether the events were persisted in Cassandra. So I'm going to navigate back to my Docker container and I'm going to select star. So under CQL shell that you created earlier, I'm going to select star from a table that's called aka.messages. Aka.messages is the table where all the events are going to be stored. And right now this should first of all succeed and the messages table should not be empty. And uh, all right, so it seems that we have some data here in Cassandra and uh, the bytes themselves are obviously serialized. So this is the actual data that's being stored. And we have the persistent ID. First of all, we have the persistent ID bank that stores the probably the bank account created message. This is it. And then we have the persistence ID for the bank account. So this is the unique identifier for the bank account that was created. Now I killed my application and I'm going to drop everything. So I'm going to reset the state of the entire thing. So I'm going to say drop table aka.messages or not drop table, but I think truncate. So I'm going to say truncate aka.messages. So I'm going to clear the table. So right now we have the uh, table header, but we don't have any data. That's good. And uh, I'm going to go back and create a full fledged reply to actor. So I'm going to say, let's call this response handler or something like that. And I'm going to 
uh, use a context spawn and I'm going to use behaviors.receive message of type response and the response ne thing needs to be imported so I'm going to import this as well and I'm going to uh, handle a partial function here so in case uh, I get this bank account created response bank account created response I'm gonna say context log info and in case I get the get bank account response I'm going to say context log info and I'm going to also return behaviors that same every time because with every message I'm going to have to return a new behavior in this case I'm going to return the same behavior and this thing will bear the name let's call this uh, reply handler or something and uh, instead of the uh, ask pattern I'm going to use the plain uh, tell pattern so I'm going to say bank tell create bank account on Daniel USD 10 and this response handler as the message and also I'm going to send this uh, get bank account so I'm going to say bank tell uh, get bank account on the ID now that ID has to be fetched from Cassandra so I'm going to comment it for now and I'm going to remove pretty much everything else in the meantime so first I'm going to send the create bank account message I'm going to check Cassandra then restart the application and I'm going to expect that the get bank account will return some actual bank account details which is a bigger test than we originally anticipated so let's try running this one more time All right, so we have a bunch of logs here, and we have unsupported access to actor context from the outside of actor. Okay, what am I gonna do here? We have context.log. Well, I'm uh, going to save that context.log. I'm gonna call this logger as context.log. And instead of using context.log, I'm going to use the logger. So logger and that will probably be it let's try to see if that we have anything here in aka.messages we do have something here in aka.messages and the the logger.info simply couldn't print anything so uh, the application did work but the loggers did not so i'm going to clear the table one more time i'm going to run the application one more time so let's try to run this All right, so we have some info. We have successfully created bank account with this particular ID, and this should be consistent with what we find on Cassandra. So I'm going to copy this bank account ID, and I'm going to try to take a look at the messages table again. So DEDA, DEDA, so this is the same bank account ID. This is great. I'm gonna stop the application. I'm not going to remove anything from Cassandra, and upon restart, I expect that the bank actor will respawn the persistent bank account with the same ID and that the bank account actor will have its own details. So I'm going to comment out the first create bank account. I'm going to uncomment the get bank account on this ID that I've just fetched. And this reply to actor will be the response handler. And if we have the account details here, then we have been successful. So we have the bank actor and also the bank account, which are both persistent. Fingers crossed. Let's see what happens. Okay, so we have account details with some. This is great. So we have bank account with the ID, Daniel, USD and $10. So notice that the data was successfully fetched from Cassandra even though the application was stopped. So Cassandra serves as our persistent store. Obviously, in this case, we don't have any further events. So these are the same two events. But as we create more bank accounts, we're going to see more events here under Cassandra. This is amazing. So we have the bank and bank account infrastructure already created for us. And uh, this will surely scale with however many bank account actors we might want to create. All right, this is this is quite great. All right, so we have the actors. Now we need that HTTP interface. So we are going to use Akka HTTP to interact with the external world and 
fetch uh, bank accounts, create bank accounts, and so on and so forth without me having to create dedicated applications to test this out. So here under the Scala folder, I'm going to create another package for HTTP. So I'm going to create a package com rock the JVM bank, and then I'm going to use HTTP. And uh, notice that IntelliJ has created this underlying HTTP package here. And I'm going to create an HTTP server that will spin up pretty much everything that we've discussed. Cool, so here under the HTTP package, I'm going to create a new Scala class. I'm gonna call this bank routes and, uh, or router. And uh, this router here will define all the HTTP API that we're going to use here for the server. So routes or router, name it however you want it. And here under the bank routes, I'm probably gonna pass some arguments because I'm gonna first assume that I'm gonna have access to the main bank actor. So I'm gonna call this bank as an actor ref of type command. And I need to import command from our own package. So here from comrock the JVM bank actors persistent account command. And I also will probably import the rest of the commands here so all the case classes that extend command. So at the least, I'm going to require this actor ref because I'm going to interrogate it. And I'm going to define my HTTP REST API. So the API goes as follows. First of all, I need a post add slash with a payload, which is a um, bank account creation request. So if I post at slash, it might actually create a um, prefix, so bank slash, I'm going to have a bank account creation request as JSON. And the happy path is going to be um, as a response, we're going to have a 201, which is created. And I'm going to also reply with a header that will contain the unique identifier of the bank account. So I'm going to have to reply with a location which is slash bank slash the UUID of the bank account that was just created. And as the logic, I'm going to ask, I'm going to send a message to the bank actor. So let me go ahead and do that first. So um, uh, I'm going to import the ACA HTTP directives. So import ACA HTTP Scala DSL uh, server directives, plural, okay. Uh, this will add all the DSL of the Aka HTTP API. I've discussed Aka HTTP in another video here on the Rock the JVM channel. And uh, I'm going to define my routes. So I'm going to have a val, let's call this bank account, or simply routes, as, and I'm going to use a function called path prefix, because I'm going to use this bank token here at the minimum. So I'm going to have bank here. And under path prefix, I'm going to nest other routes. So if the path prefix matches, so if the HTTP request has the path that matches bank, then the bank uh, prefix will be stripped and the rest of the stuff is going to be parsed. So I'm going to check for path end. So if the path prefix matches, then I will require the ACA HTTP DSL to match the path end or the single slash, so or single slash. And I'm going to also match the HTTP method. So I'm going to use the post directive. So if the path prefix matches bank, if after that we follow uh, the end of the path or a single slash, then if the method is post, then I will try to parse the payload. And uh, so I'm going to have to parse the payload I will have to define one. So I'm going to define a quick case class that will define a uh, path, uh, a bank creation request. So I'm gonna have a case class. I'm gonna call this bank account creation request or create request if you wanted to use that notation. I'm gonna have a user as a string, a currency as a string and the balance will be double. So this will closely resemble the actual command to create the bank account. So the user currency initial balance and this will be filled by me, okay? So I will try to parse as JSON the bank account creation request as a JSON object. So I will need to add 
a bunch of imports so that the JSON parsers can run automatically. And here under build.sbt, I have a bunch of libraries here. So I'm using Cersei for JSON serialization and deserialization, and this Aka HTTP Cersei for compatibility with Aka HTTP. So I'm using these four libraries. And in order to parse the HTTP uh, JSON payload correctly, I'm going to import IO Cersei generic auto, which creates um, JSON parsers and serializers for all case classes. So this is based on macros, and uh, this case class will be automatically convertible to JSON and from JSON. Now, in order to add the ACA HTTP compatibility, I'm going to also import, and the prefix is d.heikoseeburger. So I'm going to have uh, d.heikoseeburger, ACA HTTP Cersei, and uh, I'm going to use one of the implementation here, I'm going to use fail fast Cersei support. So I'm going to use everything here. And this will allow me to use a special directive called entity that will allow me to parse the payload directly into the case class that I want. So I'm going to use the entity directive, so entity. And inside the entity, I'm going to say as bank account creation request. And if the entity as bank account creation request was successful, meaning that the JSON payload was correctly parsed, then this directive will give me back the request as a case class, which is very, very powerful. So the bank account creation request will be available to me and I can do something with it. And I need to do a bunch of things. First of all, I need to uh, convert the request into a command for the bank actor. Because this is a simple case class, I need to map that to a command that the bank actor can understand. So that's the first thing that I need to do. Then I need to send the command to the bank. And then I will expect back a response. So expect a reply. And then I will uh, parse that reply or use its data to send back a response, so an HTTP response. So notice that there is a little bit of a journey that we need to complete here. Now, the first three steps to convert to send a command and expecting a reply is not really part of the routes logic itself. So I'm going to abstract these three away into a method. I'm going to call this, let's say, create bank account. And the bank actor is available to me, and I'm going to simply pass a bank account creation request. So this is the request as a bank account creation request. And I'm going to expect back a future of response. And uh, first of all, I need to import future, and also the response type, which is here. I'm going to copy this import, and I'm going to import response as well. And I'm going to leave this unimplemented for now. So uh, the create bank account method will run the first three steps. First of all, uh, convert the request into a command, send the command to the bank and expect back a response. Now, assuming that I have a response, I need to uh, send back an HTTP response. So I'm going to run an on success directive. And the on success directive uh, has a type that is pretty useless because uh, the Aka HTTP DSL uses the magnet pattern. Uh, I'm going to simply use create bank account on this request. And the magnet pattern will take care to transform this future into the appropriate internal types of Aka HTTP. And on success will take uh, a case for uh, all the responses that I might need to treat. And in this case, for the bank account creation, I only expect one single response, which is the bank account created response. Created response with an ID. Now, I also need to import all responses. So I'm going to copy this one as well. So response everything. And now I have access to the bank account created response, which is the message that the bank actor sends back to me. Okay. And uh, I will fulfill that as a future. And I'm going to show you how we can do that with the ask pattern. 
So assuming these first three steps were completed successfully, which is what this directive does, considering the response, I need to send back an HTTP response. So I need to uh, complete with a uh, directive which is called respond with header so that I send back this location thing which probably the browser will need to parse and then access another web page or something like that in the uh, Let's call this online bank application. So respond with header, I'm going to use the header code location that uh, we have here under Aka HTTP Scala DSL model headers. So make sure you import that one. So location will be used or applied with a string. So I'm going to use uh, slash bank slash and I'm going to use the identifier. So this is the unique identifier of the bank account, and this is the header of the final HTTP response. And the payload itself is going to be a complete directive, complete with status codes. This is the uh, way of uh, putting an HTTP status code. So status codes dot two hundred one created. So you have variables here for all possible HTTP uh, responses, and we have here created. So created is and uh, a simple constant that returns HTTP 201. All right, so this little magic says that if the HTTP request has the path prefix bank, then after that we have path and or single slash, then if we have the method called post, then if the payload was parsed, successfully parsed as a bank account creation request from JSON, then given the request, if I can create a bank account through this method that returns the future response, then if I have a bank account created response with a potential identifier, then I will respond with this particular header with status code 201. So there's a lot of if then logic here in this structure. All right, so to order my little messages here, this thing should stay below. Okay. All right, so we're following the logic here and I'm yet to complete this create bank account method. Okay, cool. So the create bank account will take a request and it will return a future response. Well, I'm going to first transform this request into a command. So I'm going to add a small method here under the request. I'm going to call this to command that will contain a reply to actor. So reply to as an actor ref of command, an actor ref of response actually, Re response, because this actor will be used as an intermediate actor which will store the response from the bank actor. And this will also fulfill the appropriate promise. So this will return a uh, command and this is going to be a bank account uh, command. So create bank account with the same data, which is user uh, currency and balance, plus the uh, reply to actor as the fourth argument. Cool, so I can transform this HTTP request into the command that the bank actor can understand, which contains the reply to actor that will store the response. Cool, so I'm going to run an ask pattern. So I'm gonna, first of all, uh, go ahead and import that. So I'm going to import aka uh, actor typed Scala DSL uh, ask pattern everything, which will give me the extension methods necessary. So I'm gonna say bank.ask. So the bank is the big uh, actor that will have the entire hierarchy and bank ask will take the Lambda from a reply to, so the reply to actor that is being built automatically or the intermediate actor. I'm going to pass a um, uh, request, so request dot to command on this reply to actor as an intermediary. So uh, the bank will be sent this command, which is obtained by calling this method, and the response will be stored in this intermediate actor, which will fulfill the promise. So that's the general gist about it. And we need a timeout and a scheduler, which can be found by adding an, uh, an actor system as an argument. So I'm going to make this implicit. I'm gonna call this implicit system as an actor system. 
and I don't care about the type of the actor system. And once I've made the system implicit, I only need the timeout because the system impl uh, implements the scheduler interface. So I'm going to uh, define an implicit val timeout of type timeout from okutil, and this is going to be a timeout of, let's say, two seconds or five seconds or something. Cool, now the seconds method needs to be implemented, so I'm going to import Scala concurrent uh, duration everything, which unlocks the seconds uh, extension method. So given the timeout now, and given the system, we can run the ask pattern on the bank. So this endpoint is created. All right, let's do the other endpoints. So we said we would uh, get at slash UID, but because I added the bank prefix, I'm going to have slash bank slash UID, which is the unique identifier of a bank. And um, this will not get any payload. So this is a plain get request. And as a response, we should get a 200 OK and the JSON representation of a bank account. So this is uh, JSON representation of bank account details, which is pretty much the same as we did earlier with the persistent bank account, which is, where is it? The bank account with the ID, user, currency, and balance. This is the thing. Now, for this one, I don't need to create any case classes because I don't have any payloads. So I'm going to simply chain the current route here. So at path prefix bank, so right underneath path and or single slash, I'm going to chain that with a little tilde operator, which means that if the path end or single slash was not matched, then we will try the next route. And I'm going to use path on a, um, a token that's called a segment. And uh, segment needs to be imported from HTTP Scala DSL server path matchers. And this is an extractive directive, meaning that this segment, which is the next token after slash bank, will be parsed and it will be returned back to me in the form of this unique identifier that I'm going to then use. So let me go ahead and describe the flow real quick. So first of all, I will need to, uh, well, I don't need to parse the payload. I do need to find the bank account actor. So I'm going to send a command. So send command to the bank and expect a response. So expect a reply from the bank and then send back the uh, HTTP response. So pretty much a similar flow as before. Whereas here, I don't really need to parse the payload. I only need to create an analogous method called, let's call this get bank account which takes an ID as a string. And this is a future of response, just as before, so response. And I'm again going to use the ask pattern. This time it's gonna be easier because we have all pieces in place. So I'm gonna have bank ask and given an intermediate reply to actor that Akka will create for me for this interaction, I'm going to create a get bank account message with that ID. So with the ID of the bank account that I would like to find and this reply to actor, which will be used as a uh, short lifespan actor, which will then complete this future response. Okay. So get bank account will then be used here as uh, to send a command and expect a reply. So these two were uh, completed here in this first step. And then I'm going to send the uh, HTTP response shortly. So I'm going to again call on success on get bank account with that ID. So this is the directive. And in case we get, uh, how's that response called? We have get bank account response. So we'll have get bank account response with a maybe bank account. And uh, here I might want to uh, parse the maybe bank account and deconstruct it further. So I'm gonna have a sum with an account. Then I'm going to complete with that account because the account is a data structure, therefore it can be parsed to JSON. And in case we get a get bank account response with none, that means the account was not found. So I'm going to complete with the status code not found. So status codes dot not found. 
And I'm also going to uh, run a small payload here to describe the error that occurred. I'm going to go at the top and create a case class. Let's call this failure response that contains some uh, reason as a string. So I'm simply going to create a small case class and I'm going to use this failure response here as the second argument. Let's say bank uh, account and I'm going to inject the ID uh, cannot be found. Something like that. Cool. So this was the second endpoint. So we parsed the segment, which was the next ident the next token after slash bank. So this will be the unique identifier. I'm using that to fetch the bank account as the interaction with the bank actor as a ask pattern. So I'm going to use the ask pattern here and the interactions happen automatically. And then we are going to simply parse the response as a get bank account response with some account. And this will be a data structure. If this is found, I'm going to complete that in uh, the HTTP response. Otherwise, I'm going to complete that with the status code not found. By default, if you complete with a data structure, that's automatically a 200 OK. So that is the uh, second endpoint, which was the get bank UUID. Cool. Now I want to be able to update a bank account. So I'm going to have a put here. So put slash bank slash UUID. And we're going to have a payload, which is the new bank account details. So I'm going to have my probably uh, my uh, currency and amount. So currency uh, and amount as a data structure as JSON. And I'm going to expect response. And the responses are uh, 200 OK. Um, we have uh, maybe a bad request and uh, not found if the UID is wrong. So let's have a 200 OK and a new bank account. Uh, so payload of uh, new bank account as JSON. So that's uh, one option. Let's arrange this nice. Uh, then we have uh, a 404 not found, which was here as well. So we also have a 404 not found. And we have maybe a bad request if this um, um, the currency and amount cannot be validated. I'm going to put that as a to do here. So uh, let's say 400 bad request. Uh, if the uh, request is not being validated. Let's say the currency cannot be found. Maybe it's a fictitious currency or the amount is too big or something like that. So bad request if something wrong. And uh, I'm going to add the uh, this third aspect as a to do because we don't have any validation logic yet. Cool. So let's treat these two cases for now. So here under path segment ID, um, we also need the uh, get method. So I'm going to wrap this in a get. And I'm going to put them here. Now at the same path segment, we also need to handle the put method. So here under get, I'm going to chain the put method. So the put directive, if the method was not get, then we're going to try a put. Now, the put method needs to parse the JSON payload here. I need to create one. So I'm going to create a case class. I'm going to call this bank account update request with a currency as a string and the amount as a double. And I'm also going to right off the bat create a, a command for that. So to command. And the two command method will need a bunch of things to be able to uh, turn that into a command, which is uh, the bank account as this is the response. Sorry, uh, we have an update balance. So we need the ID. So we need the ID, the bank account ID, which is a string. And we also need the reply to actor, which is an actor ref of response. And this will be a command. Cool. So I'm going to create a uh, bank account. What was that? Let's get back to the name. We have update balance. All right. So this is going to be an update balance, 
with ID, we have currency, amount, and the reply to. And that is the command that I'm going to send to the bank actor. Cool. Um, right, so let's define the flow again. So we have uh, transfer or transform, transform or parse the request to a command, which we've already done. Then we are going to ask the bank or send the command to the bank. Expect a reply. So expect a reply and then return or send back uh, an uh, HTTP response. So for this one, we're going to follow the same pattern as the first post. So we're going to parse the entity first. Let's uh, use entity as, and I'm going to have my, how is it called, bank account update request. So bank account update request. And then considering the request, I'm going to issue a command. So I'm going to transform these three into one method call. So this is going to be uh, to transform the request to a command, send the command to the bank and expect the reply. So let me go ahead and create a method. Let's call this update bank account, which takes a request. And this is going to be my uh, bank account update request. And this is going to be a future of type response. And this request will also have the ID of the bank account, which is a string. And I'm going to uh, run the ask pattern again. So bank.ask and considering a reply to actor. So reply to. And uh, this intermediate actor will serve as the placeholder for the future response. So uh, we're going to run a very similar thing. So I'm going to have request.to command because I have the method created beforehand. So request.to command on the bank account ID and the reply to actor as the recipient of the message, which will then complete the future response. All right, so this follows pretty much the same pattern as before. All right, so considering that one, I'm going to run an on success. So on success with uh, update bank account, update bank account on uh, the ID and the request. And just to remind you, this ID is being parsed here at the path segment phase. So on success. And in case I get, what was it called? We have responses. So we have bank account balance updated re uh, response with an option. So we're going to deconstruct two. Uh, so I'm going to have bank account update response updated bank account balance update response with a sum account. I'm going to complete that with an account. So I'm going to say complete with the account, which is the latest state of that bank account. And in case I get the same data structure with a none, then that means either the um, account could not be found. So I'm going to complete with the same thing, complete with a not found failure response bank account ID cannot be found now. We might want to add some validation here for, uh, for the request so that an invalid request isn't even sent to the bank account in the first place. So I'm going to add a to do here to validate the request. And this will come a little bit later to enhance the logic of our application. But right now, as it currently stands, this endpoint is also valid. So this will uh, send back HTTP response. So let me cut out the comments. So this endpoint is also complete, which brings our whole routes thing to a close. So this will serve as the logic for an HTTP server. So now we have the routes definitions and a bit of logic also there as well. We have some data validation to do, but we're going to do that later. And I'm going to create a main application so that we can actually spin up an HTTP server. So here under Comrock the JVM bank, I'm going to create uh, another package. I'm going to call this app. And under app, I'm going to spin up the actual server. So I'm going to create a Scala class. I'm going to call this bank app. 
I'm going to make it an object and I'm going to write a main method so that we can run the application as an HTTP server. Cool. Now, in order to run this application, we will need first to create the bank actor. So I'm going to create, first of all, my uh, root actor system. So I'm going to have my root behavior. And I'm going to uh, create that as behaviors, that, uh, the plural thing. So behaviors.setup. And this is going to be a behavior singular. And I'm going to use not used in this case, because the root behavior doesn't really do anything, at least not yet. So I'm going to create my bank actor. So bank actor as a context. Of course, I need to pass the context here. So context dot uh, spawn. And I'm going to have my bank thing. So I'm going to import it. Bank, I'm going to call it bank, of course. And um, this is pretty much it. So the root behavior just spins up the bank actor. Now, I also want to be able to surface that out to the outside so that I can spin up the HTTP server. Because if you remember, the bank routes class depends on both the bank actor and the actor system. So we need this bank actor to be able to interrogate it. So get back to the bank application. I'm going to define a small protocol to interact with this root actor system. So I'm going to create a trait. Let's call this root command. And I'm going to create a case class. Let's call this retrieve bank actor, which contains a reply to actor. So I'm going to have reply to as an actor ref. Now this actor ref will contain the response that this root guardian will send back to me, which will contain the actor, uh, the actor reference of the bank actor itself. So this is going to be an actor ref of and the contents are going to be the bank actor, which is again an actor ref. So actor ref of type command. Now the command thing needs to be imported. So I'm going to import that from com rock the JVM whatever. Okay, and this extends root command. Cool. Now the root behavior here is not going to be a behavior of not used, it's going to be a behavior of root command, because this is the kind of message that the root actor will receive. So the behavior is, is going to be behaviors dot receive message. And in case I get a retrieve bank actor with some form of reply to destination, so reply to actor, I'm going to tell it, so I'm going to reply to this actor, so reply to tell, and then I'm going to send in the bank actor, so bank actor. And then I'm going to return behaviors.same. So this root behavior will be able to surface the bank actor as many times as we like. Cool. Now I'm going to define an actor system in terms of this root behavior. So val system as actor system with the root behavior as the guardian actor. And I'm going to call this a uh, bank actor system or bank system. And I will want to obtain the bank actor from within the system. So I'm going to run the ask pattern again. So I'm going to import what was that aka actor typed scala DSL ask pattern everything. And the let's call this bank actor future as system put a val here. So system.ask. And considering a reply to actor that Akka will spin up just for this interaction, I'm going to create a retrieve bank account with this reply to. And this is going to be a future of actor ref of type command. Let me import future. And we need to uh, add the appropriate implicits. So first of all, I'm going to make the system implicit, which will automatically implement the scheduler interface. So this is an actor system of type root command. So right now we only have the timeout to add. So implicit val timeout as a timeout that I need to import. And this is timeout with, let's say, five seconds. Right, now I need the seconds extension method. So import Scala concurrent duration everything. 
Cool, so now we have the bank account future. All right, so given this future, I'm gonna say bank actor future dot for each. And uh, I'm going to uh, run a small method to create the HTTP server. So start HTTP server. And uh, the HTTP server is going to be a small method for me. So I'm gonna have start HTTP server, which will contain the bank actor as an actor ref of type command. And I'm also going to pass the actor system implicitly. So implicit system as actor system of whatever, I don't really care. And this is going to be a unit. And I'm going to add a to do here for uh, starting the HTTP server. First of all, let's finish this uh, implicit requirement, which is the execution context. I'm going to import that right off the bat. So I'm going to uh, say implicit val EC of type execution context. And this is fetched from the actor system itself, the thread pool. So I'm going to have system dot execution context. So bank account future dot for each start HTTP server and under the HTTP server, I'm going to uh, spin up the actual routes. So I'm going to uh, create my routes or router. Let me actually call this router instead of routes. So router. Okay, and this is going to be a new bank router, router. I don't know why the refactor didn't actually rename the class as well. So new bank router with bank. And the actor system is being passed implicitly because this is also implicit in this scope. So new bank router. Now the routes themselves are going to be router dot routes. And this will be the logic of the actual HTTP server. So I'm going to have uh, HTTP. I'm going to import that from the SCAL DSL. Of course, I'm going to say new server at, and I'm going to use localhost. You can deploy it wherever you want. I'm going to uh, put that at localhost 8080. And then I'm going to say bind routes. All right. And this expression is a future binding that I'm going to let's call this HTTP binding future. So this is a future that we can uh, monitor for completion. So I'm going to say HTTP binding future on complete. And in case we get a success, we need to import success. So I'm going to say import Scala util. And I'm going to import try success and failure. I'm going to import all of them. And in case we get a success with the binding, then I'm going to print something. So I'm going to say system dot log dot info. I'm going to say server online at HTTP slash slash. And I'm going to use the local address. So val address as binding dot local address. And then I'm going to inject here the address get host string, and then colon, I'm going to use the port. So address dot get port. All right. And in case we get a failure with some form of reason, as an exception, I'm going to say, system log, let's say error, and I'm going to say failed to bind HTTP endpoint or server because and I'm going to inject the exception here, I don't care too much. And then I'm going to try to terminate the system. So system dot terminate. Now, the on complete thing requires the actor systems execution context. So I'm going to define that here at the top. So implicit val ec of type execution context as system execution context, right, so that I can run the on complete callback. And at this point, the start HTTP server method should be pretty okay. So given the bank actor ref and the actor system, we should be able to spin up the HTTP server. And uh, we should start getting some actual requests. Now, I've written quite a bit of code, and there's bound to be a mistake somewhere. And we're going to find soon enough. And um, cool, let's try running this thing. 
Let's see. I bet we're closing on to two hours already. All right, so we have a bunch of logs here. The log is quite noisy, and if we want to set the log level to info or something, we need to add log back XML and all that kind of stuff. So this is a little complicated. Let's um, let's go to server online. Let's search for this one. So we have server online at localhost 8080. This is great. All right, so it seems that our server is running and nothing crashed in the meantime. Now here under the terminal, I'm going to spin up a new uh, terminal window and I'm going to issue my first request, which is, first of all, let's try to fetch the details of this bank account. So I'm going to copy this unique identifier, assuming that you can select star from Aka messages and you have this identifier. I'm going to copy that and I'm going to say HTTP get localhost 8080. Now I've played with uh, these this application before while preparing for this video and we have bank slash this one and we should get a JSON response. All right, so we have an HTTP 200 OK. I didn't expect this to work so quickly. And notice that the JSON says balance 10 USD ID and user Daniel. So notice that as soon as this application started, the persistent actor, the persistent actors, plural, recovered all the data from Cassandra. And now I can query them and I can surface back a response. This is absolutely fantastic. Now, let's try to see the other endpoints. So I'm going to collapse my output over here. My server is running. Let's go back to the bank router. So we have a post at slash bank and we have a bank account creation request as JSON. The bank account creation request has user currency and balance. So I'm going to issue an HTTP post. Now, by the way, I'm using HTTPy for this very handy HTTP command. If you want, you can also use curl. So curl dash x get and you can use the same URL uh, if you want to use the command line. Cool. So I'm going to use HTTP post and I'm going to use localhost uh, 8080 slash bank. And HTTPy has a very handy way of creating JSON payloads for you so that you don't have to type in all the curly braces and all the quotes. You can specify ID, not ID, uh, what was that? We have user currency and balance. Okay, so you have user equals, let's say, uh, Anna, then currency, currency equals EUR for euros, and balance equals, let's say, uh, $100,000 or something like that. So this is the post. And once you parse, or once the HTTPy parses all these command line arguments, they will be converted to a JSON argument. Let's see. So we have a 201 created. This is great. And notice that the location header was also sent as slash bank slash this unique identifier. We can also check whether the messages were being sent to Cassandra. So if I select star for messages, notice that we have a bunch of data here in Cassandra, which means that the bank accounts were created. Let's get back to this one. And I'm going to do an HTTP get at localhost 8080 slash bank slash, and I'm going to copy this unique identifier. And this is going to be a 200 OK. This is 100,000 uh, 100, euros, actually, with the ID owned by Anna. This is absolutely phenomenal. Now, let me shut down the application and let's start that again, just to make sure that both the bank accounts were uh, recovered correctly. Let's see. So the server is up and running. Let's try to run a get again. And we still have a 200 OK. This is great. So the bank accounts were successfully fetched. Cool. Let's try the other endpoint, which was the update request. Now I'm going to try to run an update request on Daniel's account. So I'm going to have, where was that? The DEDA. This is the first um, identifier for Daniel. So I'm going to have an HTTP put at localhost uh, 8080 slash bank slash this thing. And then I'm going to try to add some money into my account. So currency, so currency equals USD, 
and amount equals, let's say, $25. All right, so we have 200 okay, and now we get the entire details of Daniel's bank account, which is $35, so that's 10 plus 25, currency USD, the same unique identifier and user Daniel. All right, so all of our endpoints function quite magically, I might add. Let's try to put a negative amount, so I'm going to try to withdraw $50 from Daniel's account, so I'm gonna have an HTTP put at uh, this same URL, Currency USD amount, let's say, minus 55. And notice that we get a not found. So bank account, this thing cannot be found. Now, this is not the right error to throw, and this is quite normal because we're returning a 404. If the updating returned with a bank account uh, uh, balance update response with a none. Now, this can also return a none if the request was invalid. That is, the amount was greater than was uh, required or was acceptable for this uh, bank account balance. So let me try to fetch the current state of the bank account to see if the money was withdrawn or not. So HTTP get localhost 8080 slash bank slash this thing. And again, I have the same $35, so my money is still in my bank account. And uh, let me restart the application to understand whether the all of these events were persisted so that all the bank accounts are restored to their latest state. So not with the initial state, but with the latest state. And the Daniel account was modified to $35. So let's try running this again. And we have our $35. All right, cool. Right, so at this point, pretty much at two hours sharp into the video, we are going to add a small optional uh, piece to validate requests. And I'm gonna use a bit of cats to do that. Now, the limited time doesn't allow us to create the most beautiful abstractions in the world, but we're gonna make an attempt. So be kind with this one. So here under HTTP, I'm going to create a new Scala object. I'm going to name this validation. And in this object called validation, I'm going to define some type classes that we are going to use for data validation. And I'm going to sketch a few. Uh, these may not necessarily be the most general for this application at the state that we are right now, but they may prove quite useful. So I'm going to imagine a few forms of validation. For instance, I might require a field to be present in a JSON payload. So here we have currency USD amount negative 55. For example, we can emit the currency USD and we are going to fetch the currency from the bank account itself, for instance. So the field uh, must be present for the amount, but not necessarily for the currency, if that is your choice. So I'm going to define a trade called, uh, let's call this required that will take a type argument A, and this extends a predicate A boolean to determine whether the field with uh, the type A is present in the request. Also, we might want to not allow requests with negative, uh, negative balances if you, for instance, create an account. So if you create an account, you are not allowed to set the initial uh, value negative. So I'm going to have, let's call this minimum value. And I'm going to define a trait called minimum minimum of type A, and this extends a predicate, let's say uh, a double arrow boolean. So this is going to be for numerical values, so for numerical fields. Now, for this validation feature, I'm going to use the validated data type in cats, which is able to aggregate a bunch of errors related to a particular a piece of data and surface out all those errors. And I'm going to define a type, let's call this validation result. And I'm going to uh, give it a type argument A, and this is going to be a validated NEL, that is a non-empty list. And uh, this validated NEL will take as argument the uh, error type, which is in our case a string, or some case classes that wrap a string, and the type argument A 
for the desired value type. Now, instead of the string, I might be uh, interested in creating a trait for that. I might uh, create, let's call this a trait as validation failure. And let's assume that we have an error message as a string. And I'm going to use this validation failure instead of the string because I'm going to create some case classes for that. And uh, let's say that for numerical values and uh, string values, I'm going to create some examples of validation failures. So validation failures here. And I'm going to create, let's say, a case class. Let's call this empty field. That takes a field name as a string. And this extends validation failure. Validation failure. Failure, assuming I can spend extends and validation failure. And the error message is going to be, let's say, uh, I'm going to inject field name is empty. Let me create another case class. Let's use, for instance, a negative value. So I'm going to have negative value for field name as a string. And this extends validation failure. And uh, the error message is going to be uh, field name is negative. So we're going to aggregate all these validation failures for the appropriate fields. And I'm going to create another case class, let's say below minimum uh, value for field name as a string and the minimum value as an uh, as a double. And uh, this also extends extends validation failure. And I'm going to override the error message saying that uh, field name is below the minimum threshold. And uh, I'm going to inject minimum here. So these are some of the examples of validation failures. And we're going to aggregate those depending on the presence of these minimal or required type class instances. And some type class instances, for instance, if I want to uh, define a bunch of minimum instances for int and double, I'm going to create an implicit val. Let's call this um, minimum int, which is an implicit val. So an implicit val minimum int, which is minimum of type int. And I'm going to say, because this is a, uh, a double arrow boolean, this is going to be um, underscore bigger than equal underscore. So that is the value that I'm interested in must be uh, greater than the required value. And I'm also going to implement a minimal for double with the exact same form. And I'm also going to create an implicit val, let's call this required string. And let's assume that the required string must not be empty. So this is going to be a required of type string, and I'm going to use underscore non empty. So these are some of the predicates that I might be interested in while parsing the creation or update or other requests that I might want to issue. Now, if I want to use these type class instances, I so usage, I'm uh, going to define some uh, very simple API. Uh, for instance, I'm going to say required for a type A that tries to validate a field of type A or a value, let's call this value of type A, as long as we have an implicit required as required of A. And this is Boolean. And this simply invokes the required predicate on that. So required on A on the value. And I'm going to rename this to req so that we don't confuse the required value with the required method. And I'm also going to define something for the minimum thing. So minimum of type A, and I'm going to have a value of type A and a threshold as another A, actually a double, because that's how I compare that. And uh, I'm going to require the implicit min as a minimum of A. This is going to be a Boolean. And uh, I'm going to say min with value and threshold. So I'm going to simply invoke the API of the type class instance, whatever that might be. So once we have these in place, we can click 
some of these together. For instance, I might define a method, let's call this uh, main API. API, and I'm going to define a method called, uh, let's say, validate for minimum. So for any type for which there is a minimum uh, type class instance in scope, I'm going to say validate minimum. And I'm going to pass a type argument A for which there is a minimum type class instance in scope. And I'm going to try a value of type A and a um, threshold, which is of type double. And let's say field name as a string. Or maybe I should put the field name first. Doesn't matter that much. I'm going to return one of these validation results. So I'm going to have a validation result of type A. So because we have the requirement that there must be a minimum type class instance in scope, I can say if minimum the method, the method here that requires the type class instance here. So if minimum between value and threshold is true, then I'm going to return this value as a desired value. So as a validation result, so I'm going to say value dot and uh, I'm going to use an extension method from the cats library. So I'm going to uh, import cats implicits so that the compiler can give me all the extension methods that I want. I'm going to say valid NEL. Valid NEL is an extension method that is applicable for any data type, and this will wrap that in a validated NEL data structure here, which obviously conforms to the validation result type that I specified here in the signature. Cool. Otherwise, I'm going to uh, try to say uh, if the threshold is zero, then I'm going to return a negative value. So I'm going to say if threshold is equal to zero, then obviously the value is below zero. So I'm going to return a negative value here as an error. So I'm going to have negative value with field name. And I'm going to wrap that in an invalid NEL. So notice that this is an extension method from the cats library. Otherwise, I'm going to return a below minimum value error. So below minimum value with field name and the threshold. And I'm going to wrap that as an invalid NEL as well. So this method will take a value, a threshold and a field name, and it will return a validation result, which we can then use to surface out errors to our user. So this API will try to make the whole process of validation a little bit more transparent to the user. That's the whole goal of this uh, little attempt here. And I'm going to try to do the same thing for the required thing. So I'm going to have a validate required, required with a type argument A for which there must be a required type class instance in scope, value of type A, and a field name as a string. And this is going to be, again, a validation result of type A. Let me use the proper style here. And I'm going to say if required on that value, the required the method, which requires the uh, implicit type class instance in scope, which is specified here in the uh, type bound. So I'm going to say if required value, then I'm going to say field dot valid, uh, not field uh, value. So value dot valid NEL. So this is a valid value, a desired value. Otherwise, I'm going to return this empty field case class instance. So empty field with the field name. And uh, I'm going to wrap that as an invalid NEL. So these are our validation results. Now, notice that the code that we wrote so far is pretty generic with a bunch of implementations for some types, but it, it's only applicable for individual fields, not for requests, that is HTTP requests, which was our goal all along. So our goal was to go to the bank router and validate the request itself. So I'm going to get back to this validation object and in the so-called main API, I'm going to define a small trait I'm going to call this validator. And uh, I'm going to define a method called validate. And uh, I'm going to have my value as type A. And this is going to be a validation result of type A. Now that I've defined my simple type class uh, trait here, I'm going to define also a method that uses that. So I'm going to have validate 
let's call this request. Although this is pretty, um, pretty concrete, a name, but I'm going to leave it be. A, which takes a value of type A and an implicit instance, an implicit validator as a validator of A. And this is gonna be a validation result of type A. And obviously I'm going to invoke the validator. So I'm gonna say validator, validator.validate on A, on the value. All right, cool. So this is a general uh, type class for requests. And um, I have the main API that we'll, uh, we'll use to pass an HTTP request. Given a validator, we'll simply validate that and we'll contain a validation result, which will either contain that request or some errors that we can surface out to the user. That's the general gist at least. So let's go back to the bank router. And here we will need to implement some type class instances for the requests that we are going to handle, which are bank account creation request and bank account update request. These are the JSON requests that we're going to handle in our HTTP server. So I'm going to define them in the companion object. So I'm going to have an object bank account creation request, and I'm going to define an implicit validator. So implicit validator as a validator of bank account creation request. Now, obviously, I'm going to import validator from the package. So I'm going to say import validator or validation everything. All right, so this is going to be our implicit val. And this is going to require the validation of every individual field, the user currency and balance. So this is a validator. Well, if I want to create a validator, I can create that as an anonymous class. So new validator of a bank account creation request, where the override validate will take into account the uh, potential value, the request, so request as a bank account creation request, and I'm going to validate each individual field. So let's call this um, so we have user currency and balance. Let's assume that we want to require all of these. So we requ require the user and currency, and we also want the balance to not be negative. So I'm going to say uh, user validation as validate required for the uh, request dot user. I'm going to run the same thing. So validate required for request dot user and the field name is user. Then we have the currency. So currency validation as uh, validate. So validate again, validate required on request dot currency, and I'm going to call this currency. And we're going to validate the balance as well. So balance validation as validate required not validate required, validate minimum for request dot balance. And then we have the field name balance. All right, now I have a small error here because validate minimum requires a threshold as well. So I'm going to pass it as zero here. All right, so we have three validations here that we can combine to maybe surface a giant error or a suite of errors that we can then surface out to the user. So I'm going to combine all of these. I'm going to say user validation, currency validation, and balance validation. And then I'm going to do something that's very interesting. I'm going to import cats.implicits.everything. And I'm going to run a small function that's called map n. And map n takes an, uh, a function that will take all of these items. And if all of them are valid, then I'm going to create a bank account creation request again. So I'm going to say uh, bank account creation request dot apply. So the way that this works is that if the user validation, currency validation and balance validation are all valid results. So this validation result uh, 
only contains the valid desired value A, so if all of these three contain the valid values, then I'm going to create a new bank account creation request out of those three. If any one of those is invalid, then the final validation result, validation result of type bank account creation request will contain a non-empty list containing all the errors that might have occurred in either of these three uh, expressions. So for instance, if the currency validation was successful, but the user and balance validation were not, then this whole map n expression will contain a validation re result where the error type is going to be a non-empty list containing the user validation error and the balance validation error, as we're going to see in the console. Now, this is quite involved and it uses the cat's validated data structure to automatically aggregate those into one magical expression, which allows me to write this very, very succinctly here. I teach this in the CATS course, by the way, and we spent roughly an hour just on this sort of mechanism. So I'm skipping a lot of steps along the way, but I'm pretty sure you get the idea. Cool. So this is the validation for the bank account creation. We also need to do a very similar thing to the bank account update. So I'm gonna run an object, bank account uh, update request, and I'm going to have an implicit, implicit val validator as a validator of a bank account uh, update request. And this is gonna be a new validator of type bank account update request, where the override validate takes a bank account update request and it will have to validate these two items. So I'm going to return a validation result. So validation result of type bank account update re request. So I'm gonna run the user validation, uh, the currency validation and the amount validation. So I'm gonna copy these two and uh, we have the request here. So request, we have currency and the amount. And let's say that the minimum amount that you can either withdraw or deposit is let's say uh, one cent, so 0 0.01 of any currency. So nothing smaller than that, all right? And uh, I'm going to then uh, run another map N. So I'm going to have not balance validation, I'm gonna call this amount validation. I'm gonna wrap the stuple currency validation and the amount validation map N, and I'm going to create this bank account update request dot apply. So we're following a very similar pattern here. Now I can also use the single abstract method pattern. So instead of creating an uh, anonymous class, I can run a function, but I wanted to make this super explicit. Cool, so we have implicit type class instances for the requests that we want to handle. Right, now, bad request if something wrong and bad request if we don't have this valid all right, let's try to define a small method to validate a request. So I'm gonna have, let's call this validate request. And I think I have the validate request name in the validation bit. We have validate request. Let's rename this. I'm gonna call this validate entity or something. And uh, I'm going to come back to my routes. So validate request for the type R from request for which there is a validator in scope that takes a request as an R and this validate request will need to take a further uh, directive here that we can use uh, if the uh, request was valid. So uh, I'm going to call this route if valid and the data type of the route itself that we are going to wrap here uh, is called route with a capital R that I'm going to have to import from Aka HTTP Scala DSL. And finally, I'm going to return another route, which is the same kind of DSL that we defined earlier. So this is pretty much a piece of an HTTP server logic. So I'm going to use the validate uh, entity method that we created earlier. So this one that requires the implicit validator type class instance. So validate entity on request. 
And we're going to run a pattern match because the validated data type in cats can be pattern matched. And we have two cases, valid with a value, which contains the actual same request. I'm going to use cats data validated. So valid on whatever, because I already have the request then I'm going to return the route if valid. So if the request was validated by the validator logic, then I'm going to return the route that I wanted in the first place. And in case I get an invalid with a bunch of failures, so failures, and uh, then I'm going to return a complete directive with a bad request. So I'm going to have status codes dot bad request. And uh, I'm going to return what I return a failure response. So this is the data type that we uh, defined earlier. So I'm going to have a failure response that will simply collapse all the failures into one. So I'm going to have failures dot to list and uh, I'm going to map, I'm going to return the error message. And then I'm going to make string with, let's say, a comma or something like that. So all the failures will be collapsed into one giant string that will give me all the reasons why that request was bad. Cool. So this is pretty generic. Now I'm going to use this uh, at the top of this on success thing, because after I've parsed the entity from JSON, I'm going to validate it. So I'm going to add the validation here. So validation, I'm going to say validate request on the request. And I'm going to wrap this whole thing. Right, so we have bad request if something wrong, and also here in the bank account updates. So I'm going to copy this one, the validate request. So validation, I'm going to tab this whole thing further, and I'm going to wrap it in the validate request directive. This is a custom directive that I've created. I hope this works. So let's restart the application. Hopefully we haven't killed anything or anyone or anyone's bank account in Cassandra. All right, cool. So no errors. And uh, let me go ahead and try to create a bank account. So I'm going to have an HTTP post. And instead of saying user Anna, I'm going to say uh, user, let's say uh, Spider-Man. And uh, I'm not going to pass anything else. So I'm going to pass uh, just the user and the currency and amount I'm going to leave blank. Let's see what we have. So we have bad request. So the request content was malformed. Attempt to decode on failed cursor downfield currency. Okay. This was a bad request from parsing in the first place. So this HTTP server returned bad request in the first place. Let's say uh, currency equals whatever and amount or balance equals minus uh, minus 10. Hopefully this works. All right, so notice that in this case, the payload was properly parsed, which is good. And notice that we are now returning a bad request with our own logic. And the reason says currency is empty, balance is negative. So both errors were surfaced to the user. Cool. Now, this is the same, the, the same kind of error we're also going to see if we do the put thing, so I'm going to run an HTTP put, and um, I'm going to use Daniel's bank account with DDA, I remember that one. So instead of currency, I'm going to leave blank, and amount, I'm going to say 0 0.0001. Let's see what we got. So now we have a bad request saying currency is empty, balance is below the minimum threshold of 0 0.01. All right, so we can now surface multiple errors to the user and help them understand what was wrong with the request. And one last test that I want to make is try to withdraw more money than I have in my bank account. So I'm going to say currency is uh, USD and the amount is negative 55. And 
uh, balance is below the minimum threshold of 0 0.01. Well, we have a bug here because the amount here must be less than zero, must be bigger than 0 0.01 in absolute terms, which means I need to run a different kind of validation. So here under the validation type, I'm going to define another type class. I'm going to call this minimum abs in minimum for absolute value. And I'm going to copy these two and I'm going to uh, run some type class instances for minimum abs. So I've defined some type class instances here and the minimum int abs is going to be a math.abs for the first argument needs to be bigger than the second argument and same for the double thing. All right, I'm going to also have um, a method that does pretty much the same thing with minimum abs. So value threshold implicit min as a minimum abs. So I'm going to call this method one more time. So this is good. And I'm going to define a another method validate minimum abs with a type argument a for which there is a minimum abs in scope with a value of type a a threshold, which is a double and the field name, which is a string. And this returns a validation result of the same type. And I'm going to run a pretty similar logic. So if um, minimum abs with the value and the threshold, then I'm going to return value dot valid nil, not empty list. Otherwise, I'm going to return below minimum value with the um, field name, field name and the threshold. And uh, I'm going to wrap this in an invalid NEL. OK, so now we have validate minimum, validate minimum abs. Now I'm going to go back to my bank router and I'm going to add some validation here under the validator. So in the, um, the in the bank account creation request, I'm going to modify the balance validation to be above zero and also be in absolute terms bigger than 0 0.01. So I'm going to combine that with so I'm gonna use that uh, with combine with validate minimum abs with the same argument. So request balance the 0 0.01. This is the absolute terms. And then I'm going to have my same balance field here. And same for the bank account update request. So validate minimum request amount 0 0.01. This is validate minimum abs here. So just the minimum in absolute terms, I don't require this to be either positive or negative, only that in absolute terms, this should be bigger than 0 0.01. And uh, let's try rerunning this. Because we've just changed the logic of validation. So the Akka HTTP server should be intact. Let's try to uh, modify Daniel's bank account with negative 55. All right, so saying bank account cannot be found. This is a different bug, which is great. Let me run an amount 0 0.001 just to make sure that the threshold was matched successfully. So we have balances below the minimum threshold 0 0.01. Now this is not balance, but this is the amount. Amount it's called. Let's try to rerun this because otherwise the error might be misleading. We have the server up and running. Let's try this again. All right, so amount is below the minimum threshold 0 0.01. And this is the same if I want to deposit or withdraw a smaller amount. So amount is below the minimum threshold 0 0.01. Okay, cool. Let's try to fix this one with a bank account cannot be found. And I think I know what's happening here because after we get a none here, we return a not, not found. And a none is also returned if you try to withdraw more money than you have in your bank account. So we need to fix that and we need to return a different kind of data structure. So I'm going to go back to my persistent bank account. And in the bank account updated response, instead of an option, I'm going to return a try. So I'm going to uh, return a try from Scaliotil and now I have some compiler errors. And in case of none, I'm going to return a failure. So I'm going to return a failure with a new, I'm going to return a failure 
uh, with new runtime exception saying uh, cannot withdraw more than available. And uh, in the case of sum, I'm going to return a success. So success is the equivalent of sum in the try world. So now in the case of failure, we also have the reason why that operation failed, which is much better. And uh, in the bank actor, we also need to uh, treat this one because the bank is the one to uh, search for the bank account actor. If it's not found, we return a none. And I'm going to return a failure. Again, I'm going to uh, import that from Skyutil with a new runtime exception saying the runtime exception saying the bank account cannot be found. So bank account cannot be found. Now I'm using try here, but you can use different data structures. And uh, this is a little bit in contradiction with cats, because uh, we're using try here. But let's at least see that the error was solved. And then we can change this failure into maybe an either or something. So we have sum and we have success with the account and failure with an exception. And in the failure, I'm going to, uh, first of all, I'm going to import these. So from Scala Util to go at the top. So Aka Util, you need to go import Scala.util, and then I'm going to try uh, success and failure. All right, so we now have the types in place. So we have failure with an exception, failure response, and I'm going to uh, return instead of bank account, I'm going to inject x dot get message or something. Let's see. Get message. All right, so we have that. Let's try to build it. And let's try to recompile. I think my laptop is taking off. All right, so we're in the clear now. Let's try to go to the bank app and run the application again. All right, so we, now we have the server up and running. Let's try to put some money into Daniel's account. So we have amount is below the minimum threshold at the validation stage. I'm going to say amount minus 55. All right, so the reason saying cannot withdraw more than available, so the error was fixed. And instead of a 404, I'm going to return a 401 with a bank, uh, bad request. And I think we're in the clear, so I'm going to come on IntelliJ, autocomplete this for me. All right. Cool. So at this point, our big application is complete. And we've used Akka Actors, Akka Persistence, Akka HTTP. We also have Cassandra for Persistent Store. And we also have Cats, JSON parsing, and a bunch of other goodies. All right, folks. So that was a giant journey. If you've gotten to this point, I massively, massively appreciate it. I hope this video was useful and you got a lot of techniques out of this. If you like this video, go ahead and click the like button and check out Rock the JVM. It has tons of material on Scala, Akka, Apache Spark, Cats, and everything in the Scala ecosystem. We have courses on everything that you've seen here, including Akka Actors, Akka Persistence, Akka HTTP, Cats, and obviously the Scala language. And we have more than 200 hours at this point with the latest in the Scala ecosystem. So join us at Rock the JVM and follow Rock the JVM on Twitter and LinkedIn as I post fresh updates on upcoming material. Until the next one, folks, I'm Daniel signing off.